Welcome back to Inside the Box. I'm Joanna Lee, and today we are celebrating the second episode of 2021's Canadian Artist Series. Today, we bring you the runner-up prize winner of 2020's prestigious Orford Music Competition. As part of his prize, he will be performing with the Montreal Philharmonia Mundi Orchestra as a soloist in the 2021-2022 season. In addition to his recent success, he has been performing actively with the Orchestra Metropolitan in Montreal and Quebec Symphony Orchestra. Also, he has been actively teaching at the École de Musique Vincent Dindy and in the summer, Tutti Music Camp. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Montreal-based harpist, Matt Dupont. Bienvenue, Matt. Wonderful to have you here. Hi, Joanna. How are you today? Great, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Temperature is quite high today. <laughs> I bet, yeah, it's it's pretty hot where I'm at too, but maybe it's just the building, who knows? <laughs> Haven't gone outside yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to start off with your origin story and how you got to where you are musically today. So that includes from where you started and yeah, your journey. So yeah, like uh, basically uh, I started like doing a bachelor in musicology at the Paris Sorbonne University back in 2010 to 2013. And then one year after I had the amazing opportunity to actually uh, live abroad in uh, China, in uh, Suzhou, it's um, the countryside of Shanghai. And I studied for one year with a French harp teacher uh, at the Suzhou University School of Music. And then later on, I graduated from a master in, um, in harp performance at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And eventually, I set my, my luggage in Montreal in 2018. And this is where I am. I graduated from an artist diploma over there in 2018. And now like living my best life as a freelancer here. Yeah. So my experience, I actually got my experience uh, in music from Paris and the, the region of the Parisian region. I performed also with uh, a local artist in Sojo, China, and also in Vancouver, in Van on Vancouver Island, and eventually in Montreal in the Quebec area, because Quebec is a huge province and uh, it's really spread out. So, But there's a lot of like... Uh, music communities over the, over here so you have to drive a lot so from uh, Quebec then to Montreal, Rimouski, everywhere name it I win it I yeah and also like a few competitions in uh, in the US Chicago and New York that actually made my debut in the in the US way that's amazing let's talk about the main roles and ensembles you are currently involved in today Sure. So uh, these days I'm actually uh, focusing on my solo career as like the pandemic hit us uh, pretty hard even here in, in Montreal. So that was a way to, uh, instead of just like uh, whining and trying to have gigs, I actually try to um, to look at myself for, for other opportunities and in, in what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a solo career and also uh, a few uh, orchestra gigs uh, here and there this day. So Orchestre Metropolitain, Orchestre Symphonique de Laval, and uh, as well Rimouski. And uh, yeah, a few other are coming up. That's amazing. Yeah. So speaking of the harp, can you tell us about the history of the instrument? Sure, I can. So basically, it's, a, it's one of the oldest instruments with the flute. Uh, it takes its roots in, uh, in the ancient Egypt, where we can see the instrument uh, without a colon. We call it like an open frame harp at this day. We can see uh, one of the oldest ones in the Musée du Louvre in Paris. And uh, further, further on, uh, you can see a smaller version, the Bardic or Troubadour harp in the Middle Ages. And then it slowly made his comeback um, in uh, the 18th century when uh, Marie Antoinette actually uh, decided to pick it up 
and then it got popular and fancy. This is where you, you can see it like all in all the paintings from this day. Eventually the instrument uh, uh, was fancier with uh, Berlioz when it put it back like in a 19th century revival, especially in his Symphonie Fantastique, second movement. And this is where the orchestral uh, life of heart actually started. And then you can see it in Strauss, Wagner, name it, and so on. And eventually in the 20th, 20th century, with Debussy, Faure, for the French Impressionism. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now it's all over the, the planet and in, uh, even in Vancouver, Montreal, Paris, uh, everywhere. Every composer actually now composed for heart. That's amazing. So I was also wondering, can you give us a demonstration mm -hmm on the different performance practices on the harp? Yeah, I'll show you a few actually. Okay, awesome. Hello, so this is my harp studio and this is the harp. I'm gonna show you two different instruments. Uh, this is the big one and this is the smaller one here. So these two harps are different. So this is the classic, classical pedal harp and this one has seven pedals for the seven notes of the scale, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we have seven pedals on this harp. The other one is called the lever harp because it has lever. I'll go back to this, go to this one a bit after. So um, basically for these two harps, we use our fingertips to uh, play the, the harp. But the pinky are not the pinkies are not used because they're too short to be uh, um, to work perfectly in the position we have like this. So this is how the strings, the pedals. We use our fingers, and this is how we pluck the instrument. So the instrument has different techniques. the The normal or regular one is just like plucking the strings and just articulating the, the your fingers so and yes I haven't said but we have different colors on the strings and those are a uh, little help for us to actually know where we are at so this is the so we have red for the C's so black or blue depending on what you're looking at right now so this is F sorry out of tune <laughs> and uh, so in between you have so do re mi fa so la si do and so on it goes it repeats every time and so the pedals are actually there to help us do the ac accidentals so we have flats, naturals, and sharps. And all the pedals are actually linked through seven rods within the column and then goes underneath here. The whole mechanism is uh, right there. And each string has two, each string has two discs for one for the lever for the naturals and one for the sharps. So right now my heart is tuned in C flat major or B major if you want. So we can do like a scale in C flat major. And then once I press on the first notch, then I will be in whole natural. And then the second notch it's called the single, the, the second movement, Sing, uh, second action in English, sorry. And this is the sharps. And this is how we can do our all accidentals at the same time. Well, keep, we're, uh, we keep playing and pressing the pedal. So it's like your brain is divided in four. So two for the, for the two hands and two others for the two feet. And this is challenging, but at the end you, you get used to it. And this is also the special effect on the harp where you can have the glisses. So you have E sharp and F natural with B natural 
B sharp, sorry, and C natural, and gives the, the famous glissando. We can have effects, another one. So this is another technique called the glissando. We also have the bibiliando, which is basically re fast repeated notes, but the two notes at a different, uh, different manner. So it would be like E sharp and F natural, for instance. Also an effect used a lot in orchestras. So we could we have... We can use our nails for effects as well. And so on. We can have pitch bending also on the strings. better on the nylons here. Yeah, we have the pedal bliss also, where, um, or just jazzy. We can have this, also a sweep, like this. And now on the second harp, so this is the same, but it has levers. So for the levers, basically, when you're playing one, you cannot, you have, if you have accidentals, you have to stop playing the, the left hand to actually grab the lever here. So I don't know, I would be... So I cannot play as fast and the same a repertoire that I can have here, like more Celtic. And also the sound is more like it's um, shimmering and more Celtic, as I can uh, hear from here, from there. This one is more used in the orchestra as well for big, big solos, big everything. And uh, for solo repertoire, we can play as well as piano music, like this short extract. For instance, we can play piano, we usually also for we use um, music from the lute, from guitar, from harpsichord, for these eras that composer did not write for harp. So yeah, so this is the harp. And if you have more, uh, if you are looking for more information, feel free to contact me or, or write in the description below. Thank you. Wow, what a beautiful instrument. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. So I was wondering, what do you believe was the key factor in your recent success for the Orford Music Competition? Well, I think uh, it's because this is the very first time actually uh, um, I trusted myself and I was confident in what I was doing. And in a way, you know, it was like all fresh because usually when we take competitions, we also have our lives, so we have to uh, go to one gate to another and then you have uh, some time to prepare an, uh, an audition and so on but this time we had nothing because of the pandemic and then uh, I remember just like sending my application to this and I was like meh we'll see if I'll get selected or not and then when they say congratulations you'll you made it to the semifinals and I was like oh oh okay so now I have to practice. <laughs> so I did. And uh, actually, yeah, I was like, uh, uh, um, I was just like saying to myself, just practice and do it. You'll see and it's just take it as an experience. And eventually I made it to the final for the first time. And then when they said I was like at the second place, I was, oh my God, yeah. 
For this, the the main factors was like confidence, pacing as well, like and uh, and I used a lot of like recording devices to see how I was like pacing myself and I was like playing and uh, and to actually be more in in the music at the time I was on on stage. That's amazing, and you know I really. I've seen you actually while we were at school together, um, really practicing hard. In fact, I think I used to call you a hobo because um, the music was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I was just like, "Go home, you hobo!" But um, yeah, I guess all that practicing really paid off, and yeah, look at you now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So persistence is the key. I'm thinking. Right. It is, and actually, like every time, every experience is not a failure. It's just like a failure to a bigger success eventually, and、uh, never actually、uh, look back and just like keep going. That's amazing. That's like an Edison way of looking at things. You know, Tom Edison, the ten thousand ways that didn't work out,、mm-hmm. so、finally found that one.、Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So I was wondering, what is it like to have multiple roles as a soloist, ensemble performer, and a teacher? Well, it's a challenge every day, and you have to, to actually have a schedule pretty tight. Like you know, I never go out without my calendar because it you have to be really、uh, organized in a way. Absolutely. Because、uh, you don't want to miss an opportunity, or you want to be like consistent with every role you have. So it, yeah, it takes organization, and、uh, but it's refreshing because every day is different from the day before and the day after.、Mm-hmm. So I, I I love it this way. That's amazing. Is there one role that you prefer? Huh? It's.、Uh, I don't know. They all have their their own specifics. So maybe because I like the the spotlight, I would say a solo career. Okay. Yeah.、Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I could see that. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. So based on your previous experience as a student and current position as a teacher, how should one approach teaching and educating students? As a journey. I would say it's not like you graduated and bam, you have your diploma and you become a, a teacher and you have the position of the teacher.、Mm-hmm. I think for now, nowadays,、uh, we're better prepared to actually go in the wild of like teaching,、mm-hmm. and、um, it's、um, in a way I.、Uh, I approach teaching more like、uh, also learning a path for for myself,、mm-hmm. and sometimes when I'm like、uh, explaining a hard passage in a in a movement or a page, then I would actually explain with a lot of details and how I would actually practice myself. And some days, like students actually make you progress.、Uh, From your your own perspective, and you're like, oh, I'm teaching that, but I never respected that rule. So maybe I will start respecting this rule. <laughs> and、uh, yeah, so teaching is、um, is open minded as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you hit it right on the nail.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. So going back to your career as a performer, where do you get your inspiration? Uh, you mean like as a、um, in an orchestra or more in a in solo? I guess solo because that's the main role that you prefer. Yeah,、uh, I would say myself, of course, and I have to. You have to believe in yourself, and also and、uh, my、uh, my main teacher I had. So I would mention Caroline Lizard in Montreal and also Heidi Crutzen in、uh, Vancouver now in London, UK. Yeah. And they were actually they are actually my、uh, my go to when I have to think about music and I would always wonder how Heidi would phrase it and how Carol would approach this、uh, this passage and、uh, and as a whole as well. And、uh, nowadays.、Um, I recently discovered meditation, 
and actually it actually it's growing like it's a little seed in my brain right. and uh and when you can actually use it on stage and like be more focused so that's uh that's how i do it absolutely wow that's amazing i think meditation does help a lot of artists actually especially since it really calms the nerves and you really mm -hmm. reflect on what you um, intend while making music Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do you personally decide on who to collaborate with, especially when it comes to small ensembles or like orchestral roles? Well, for orchestra, I would not uh, decide. I'm like, I'm mainly on the list. And, uh, and when they call me and be like, yeah, uh, I'll do it. But, you know, for, from experiences, there are ensembles you don't want to collaborate with anymore. Like you have like, uh, a bad experience or you're like no this is it um i've had it so it's it's this is how i would do it for uh ensemble like in, in chamber music and uh i think it's it's the interaction not only as a musician but also as a person you know for me it's more like making music is beautiful but if you're making music with someone that is actually hollow inside and um then how would you do it like how would you build bridges between people and this is how would i would feel so it's like more a first of, a, of an approach if i if there's someone or an ensemble that i actually feel comfortable with like as talking with this with their people mm -hmm. then i would actually uh try to make a collaboration but if it's just like purely musically and i don't have any um connection with the people then I would not. That's totally understandable. I think connection is the mm. biggest key, right? And sometimes you might be really good friends or not have such great chemistry or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how music works like that because you would think that um, if you have good chemistry in friendship, you would also have good chemistry in, you know, when you make music. But I think it's all about where you are on the level of making the interpretation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when selecting repertoire as a performer, who is your biggest musical influence? I would say um, Henriette Renier. She is like a composer uh, of the early 20th French century. Okay. Uh, she's only known uh, among the, the harp con uh, community, yeah. but not in the world. And I think she needs her uh, she, we need to bring her the spotlight on her as uh, she actually made tremendous advances for the heart of, that we know today. Mm -hmm. So, and in a way, it's like, if I want to like uh, build a, a repertoire for a concert or a, a tour, right. I would actually try to uh, make it like uh, as an idea or, mm -hmm. or just uh, not only a bunch of like random composers but like the main id would be like all the same like for now i'm uh building i have two actually um uh project one is like french music so uh it's the early 20th century so this is like the main key for all together will be impressionism uh for them they're all regrouped under the same box or category Yes. And the other one is more like Russian music or or more like a symphonic poem, but as a only one instrument. So this is how we do it. Like always have like a main uh, musical idea. Mm. Yeah, it's that's amazing. Actually, I I didn't know that about the harp community having that. Um, you know, such strong conviction, especially in the impressionist movement. But that sort oh, yeah. of also makes sense too, because I think there was a very prominent role in uh, mm -hmm. Ravel Zagan, right? Where you're mainly the soloist and you have a duet with the violin soloist, which is, I think, incredible and very phenomenal in that sense. Yeah, exactly. This is like, um, we have composers like the bit, we don't actually, as, uh, as an instrument, we don't have the big names uh, such as Beethoven, Mozart, they haven't composed for us. Mozart composed like a, a concerto for flute and harp, but this is it, uh, because it was commissioned. 
but nothing about Schubert, nothing about uh, Haydn or Beethoven. So we actually uh, hold on the secondary composers or the few big names we have. So we have like only two forays, we have uh, a few Debussy, uh, we have one Ravel. So it's we're just uh, building up on this one, but also using Caplet or again Renier or uh, like um, not very much known names. So right. they're big for us in our community. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, would you say Saint Saëns <clears throat> is one of the composers that are the main? Right, I think so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He composed like a fantasy for harp solo, another one for violin and harp. He actually composed like a concerto. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Um, can you tell me more about the recent projects you were involved in? Yeah, sure. So I have um, I recently uh, performed with a few orchestras and they were all like broadcasting. Mm -hmm. um, and there's one of the Orchestre Metropolitain. We did the, the recording audio uh, a few weeks ago, and we're about to do the video. I cannot tell you much more about like the, the old project. It's not like public yet. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Well, just and, have to uh, share that. Yeah, with the audience. Yeah. When you want exactly. to know. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I have uh, two solo recitals. One upcoming in two weeks, and it's going to be our door and another one in the fall and um, preparing for this winter a concerto for heart with orchestra mm -hmm. so it's uh, yeah it's busy and it's pretty thick on the on the stand these days yeah well you seem like you're super active during the pandemic and it really paid off mm -hmm. yeah so it just seemed like, you know, you being active during the pandemic really paid off. Speaking of projects, are there any aspirations or goals or, you know, upcoming projects that you're going to be involved in and that includes competitions? Yeah, uh, so uh, for competition, I'm King of Prix d'Europe in June 2022 um, here in Montreal. And another thing I wanted to, my, another big project is actually create my own organization like a non-lucrative uh, organization here in Montreal mm -hmm. and to make more collaboration with a, 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 a quartet here based in Montreal called the Cobalt Quartet. Yeah. So yeah, these are the, the, the few projects I have in mind. That's amazing. Well, we'll just have to make a project together because we've always said that we would and there has yeah. not been an opportunity yet. We have to. Absolutely. So, I'm going to hold you accountable for that. <laughs> I will. Yeah, please do. Please do. Maybe we can do it like in music on Main or or music in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, that would be amazing. So going back to, you know, with the pandemic and with the way of the world today, how can we bring in cultural diversity and openness to society, especially during these times? I think music is important and we actually can uh, lead uh, the, uh, the community through music and, um, and have more like uh, minor composers uh, brought to the stage, uh, such as we have like the, the Black Movement, uh, uh, Black. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. So, and like all of a sudden we're like, oh, we're going to open files and we find like uh, black composers and it's like oh so you need actually to have like such tragedy to do this so maybe we can just like uh, try to uh, see from another perspective and uh, instead of like using this uh, movement uh, for, um, uh, for publicity to actually try to inverse and do it like before that so using like black uh, composers and as well as uh, indigenous composers but to bring it more it's uh, I don't know for for the west coast but like in Montreal here the community actually we have a lot of like indigenous and uh, oh, yeah. uh, composers and uh, commission yeah right. Right. so going back to your many accomplishments what are your proudest ones 
Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, my saddest one is actually I made it to Montreal, mm-hmm. and uh, actually um, uh, making my own path. So this is uh, my main, uh, my what I'm the most proud of. Absolutely. So, as a leader in the Canadian music community, how would you help or inspire future generations? Uh, in listening and also uh, learning from them and teaching them to actually even be more open-minded. I think the next generation is even more open-minded than the previous ones, like us. Yes. And 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 actually learn from them and to help them. It's um, just yeah. I would say listening to them and uh, uh, supporting them. Absolutely. That's a really great answer. Thank you for sharing that. And so, yeah, I was wondering, what does it personally mean to be Canadian? (laughs) So I'm not Canadian yet. I'm on my way. But uh, I don't know. It's uh, multicultural. Sorry, I'll do it. Multiculturalism. Thank you. And uh, it's... uh, yeah, open-minded or with a, with an open heart and be curious of everything. This is what I actually Canada welcomed me uh, many times in Vancouver, in Montreal, in Alberta. So uh, this is how I see it. It's a really a fresh start on this continent. Absolutely. And would you say that um, the environment was very different from your you know, homeland and your hometown in, in Paris? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, this is how I see it. It's like, of course, the environment, just like speaking of nature, it's just dramatically different and I love it. It's so different from each province. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it, musically, you know, uh, Europe is a small continent and there's a lot of competition uh, in music or any, or any field. So yeah. it's a lot of like people for just a few job opportunities rather than here everything has still has to be done and uh, it's, it's huge like if I think just for Quebec I think we're just 20 professional harpists all for the, the entire Quebec and actually so far we haven't like tiptoed on each other so oh, yeah. We have, yeah. Wow, sounds like you all work well together. And would you say that um, Quebec is very much similar to what Europe is in, in, you know, structure, form, architecture? Architecture, yes. Structure, form, no. Mm -hmm. I think people are more prepared here. (laughs) (laughs) And especially in orchestra. But, uh, but, yeah, they're no, they're they're definitely different. We don't have the same, uh, we don't, we don't have the same fears, and and you know in Europe you have to start music at a very very young age, mm-hmm. um, and here it's like it's okay if you're 18 and you just like uh, just started an instrument and you want to make it your career, but so yeah. we'll give you the chances to actually make it, and if you do this, like, for my opinion in France. People would be like judging you. I'll be like, oh my God, you won't make it anyway. And this is not possible. I, there's like a judgment and also jealousy, I would say. Like everybody would be jealous from each other mm-hmm. rather than here. It's like, mind your own business and do it. Just do it and uh, you'll grow. Absolutely. That's the right attitude to have, especially since, you know, it's more to do with personal growth than comparison against another artist. And yeah, that just speaks volumes to your integrity. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So this is like why I chose actually Canada for this. Mm-hmm. Well, because... I will consider you as Canadian. <laughs> Aw, thank you. Yeah, it's just like we're more open-minded here and you can make progress at any at any stage, at any age. So this is what I liked about it. And just like, nobody's gonna judge you. Everybody's gonna be very supportive and it will encourage you to actually in your personal growth. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really important, personal growth, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so how did you celebrate Canada Day this year? 
Well, uh, Canada Day is actually not a, it's not big, uh, big of a deal in, a, in, in Quebec here. Yep. But I think, like, for myself, we enjoyed a, a beautiful ride on our bikes uh, in a park uh, close to a house. Mm -hmm. And we actually enjoy the summer. Yeah, it, it's very beautiful, especially in the summer, I heard. And, you know, you're in one of the most culturally diverse areas. So um, I don't know if it happened yet, but I do remember having great times at the Montreal Jazz Festival. Are you uh, planning to attend? I think there is not a jazz festival this year because, again, because of the pandemic, they're slowly coming back in uh uh, in the late August, maybe the jazz festival will uh, will appear, yes. but I'm not very um, I'm not 100 percent sure about it. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, so I am enjoying like riding my bike and also running here, and um, we enjoy going to the Lac Saint Jean, so it's like uh, up in the north. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's beautiful, and there's so much to do in in Quebec and also uh, around in Ontario. So. Yeah, we're pretty lucky to have it here. And eventually the U.S. border will open uh, next month. So we're excited to just go to the border in Vermont yeah. and then come back and say like, we went to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, it was really wonderful to have you here. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and talents with us today. Thank you for having me at Inside the Box. It was a real pleasure for me to be here with you. Yeah, and it's, it's always great to see you again. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Your support and time means everything. After this, you will have the opportunity to watch some of Matt's performances here and you will not want to miss it. So please enjoy. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe and hit that notification bell. In the meantime, please be well and just keep showing up and supporting brilliant artists like Matt. See you next time. Bye. Bye.
Thank mm-hmm. you.